Hi, and welcome to our program. Welcome, everybody. I am Keith McDonald. It's good to have you here. This is the premiere episode of our Keith Chat series. We'll call it season one. Not sure how many episodes yet, but uh, we're kicking things off today with a live interview. And um, what we're talking about really is artificial intelligence and all its derivatives. So that could mean everything from algorithms to uh, privacy to data and ethics. And speaking of ethics, that is the conversation that we're going to have today. My guest comes to us all the way from Edmonton, and this is a screen capture of her LinkedIn page. We'll show you the address as well. By all means, check her out on LinkedIn. And by the way, there is a website that I recommend you go to as well, ethicallyalignedai.com. So let's hear a bit about our guest. It's Katrina Ingram, and uh, she is the founder of the social enterprise, Ethically Aligned AI. She works with organizations and advises senior leaders on AI governance and moving AI ethics principles into practice through a mix of research, training, and consulting. She also speaks about responsible AI, privacy, and data ethics to corporate audiences, community groups, and the media. So that being said, let's bring our guest into the screen. There we are, the both of us. So welcome, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Well, thanks so much, Keith. I'm honored to be your first guest. <laughs> yes, uh, it's going to be an interesting ride. We'll see how, how things go. I'm excited to talk about ethics, of course, because I think it's one of the most important things that may or may not be um, latched onto by enough people, at least in my opinion. There's, there's a lot going on with artificial intelligence, and that actually leads me to my first question, because when we first spoke, it was quite a while ago, and chat GPT had yet to appear on the scene. And now that it has, I find I can't do any kind of a presentation without talking about it. And people are, are um, more, more uh, focusing in on AI now because of it. Many have used it at work or even at play. So my question to you to kick things off would be, um, have you noticed a difference in your work in ethics with government and so on, corporate clients, around chat GPT? Has it made it easier for you or harder for you? Well, 100%, I've noticed a difference. And like you, I was working in this field prior to ChatGPT arriving on the scene. And so it did really mean that I had to update a lot of things because, of course, people really wanted to talk about ChatGPT specifically or generative AI more generally, but I had to address it. And in terms of has it made it harder or easier, I would say a little bit of both. So the ways in which it's made it easier really are around the the opportunities to have the conversation. So when I started out, my, when I started my company in 2021, it was early 2021, I was having conversations with organizations, but they still weren't quite sure. How is AI going to impact them? Is this really going to happen? Lots of uncertainty. And so because of that, they were really weren't sure if they needed to have a chat about ethics, because if AI wasn't a thing, then why did they need to worry about ethics? And so that was the conversation in early 2021. Fast forward to the end of 2022 into 2023, that whole dynamic changed. And instead of should it, do we need to have this conversation? It was pretty much, we really need to have this conversation right now. So that was kind of the good part. The, the part that's challenging, I think, for, for folks like us who've been paying attention to this space for a while is getting people to think more expansively than just chat GPT, which literally is, is one product, or even generative AI, which is an important development for sure, but it's not the entirety of the AI story. And so I think getting people out of that space to uh, think about these topics in a bigger way is, is a challenge that we have. I think those are good points. And, and for me, I, I've made a point of not doing an exclusive, even though I've been asked a chat GPT workshop. Uh, because of that, really, I think, yeah, just what you said, perfect. <laughs> um, and I think, too, what I like to talk about when I mention ChatGPT is, is around the company's desires and what 
their goals are and some of the issues they've had already in terms of people leaving and their mission statement is kind of evolving and those kind of issues I think relate certainly to values and ethics and where do they want to end up and are we as citizens prepared to see it go that far? Which actually leads me to um, another question around the agency of the audiences that you're seeing. I like to talk about this is, is that a lot of people don't think they have any agency in the conversation. Do you, first, so first question is, do you, do you encounter people who think they have no say in company ethics? Or are mm. they more definitive? Yeah, well, this is what I think. And... Yeah, I mean, I think that there are different degrees or ways of thinking about that question. I suppose to kind of, you know, cut to the chase, where I like to leave everyone is that not only do you have agency, but you actually have a role in all of this. You have a really important role. And it doesn't really matter whether you're an end user or you're, you know, sometimes people feel, well, I'm not a developer. What am I going to do? I'm just an end user. Well, you actually have a lot of things to say about the way the world is, policies you want to see, all of that. So I think that there is a voice that you have even as a consumer. But if you're involved in, um, in building these technologies, for example, in a company that's building commercial AI of some sort, or even in a company where you're building something internal for your organization, then you have a bigger role to play and you have a lot of choices that you can make from a design perspective in terms of how these technologies are going to be built, what kind of policies will be in place for their use. So they become kind of a bigger set of, uh, of responsibilities there. And then if you're an organization, let's say you're buying these technologies for use in some way, you have another role to play where you're responsible for the rollout of these technologies in the context of your organization. So I think there can be ethical considerations all along the chain. And I think there is agency all along that continuum as well from end user consumer to someone who's building the technology. Um, can I ask how much of your audience would be, let's say the management side, or do you actually do a bit of both in the combinations at times? I do a lot of, yeah, I do a mix of, of a lot of different things. So on the one hand, I teach. So I'm talking to students. I'm talking to the next generation of people who might be building these technologies or, or the policy makers. So there's those audiences. There are community audiences, which I love. Um, I was at a senior center last week, and I love doing those kinds of talks for community groups who are just starting to learn about these technologies and what they mean for, for their lives. Um, but then in terms of some of the work that I do as a business, those audiences are typically either management or policy makers, in some cases also the designers and developers as well. And I do more of consultation type work with them, uh, whether that's workshops or advisory work or writing policy. So it really spans the gamut of different kinds of audiences that I work with. And I guess the topic of ethics itself isn't really a new topic, but I've found that that it seems to be ratcheted up or amped up when we talk artificial intelligence. But have, have you found you, you've been able to draw upon other conversations pre-artificial intelligence? I mean, uh, I'm sure companies have had to deal with this with their HR groups and all kinds of things. I'm wondering how much you've drawn upon from past information to bring into the AI discussion. Oh, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. I mean, ethics ethics as a topic is a very, very old topic. Um, and in, as, even as it relates to companies, I would say there's always been things like information ethics or technology ethics, but it hasn't maybe necessarily gotten the attention, perhaps. What, I, what I'm finding is that AI is shining a very bright spotlight on all things digital, and we're kind of putting it all under this AI banner. And now we're all really paying attention to the technologies and their impacts and that, for me, has kind of just ramped up this need to have the ethics conversation. But I think it was already there. And in fact, when I look back, um, the things that I draw on are bodies of work that have been done in technology ethics, in information ethics, and even in business ethics in a more general sense. So it's been around for a while, uh, ethics, I mean, as a field. But bringing the attention to it from an AI perspective, I think, has just kind of heightened everything. I found on your uh, website, I should point out, you have a toolkit that's available. And I was looking at that today. And uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about the toolkit, but I like the term AI blind spot. It seems to be one of the things that um, you start with. And, and I'm wondering how significant that is in your experiences with audiences, uh, even getting agreement, you know, that we have blind spots. 
Yeah, yeah. First of all, I want to say that 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 wasn't my term. Um, it, it, it refers to a tool that was developed by a group of researchers. This is uh, several years ago now. And they put together this set of cards that help to identify these blind spots, particularly from the perspective of AI developers. That was kind of their core audience. But just kind of jumping off this term, AI blind spots or having blind spots, I think it's a really, um, you know, it's an important thing to consider because we all come to conversations with our lived experience, with our perspective, with our implicit biases. And that means all of us are going to have some kind of blind spots. And so that's why having a diverse group of stakeholders really have um, input into how these technologies are built and deployed is really important. Because when you have that diversity, you're more likely to be able to see other people's blind spots and help address them. And so that's one of the ways that you can um, move forward with responsible AI is having a diverse group of stakeholders weigh in on the technologies. Yeah, I can see actually using it in, in a session myself with the audiences that I see <clears throat> to talk a bit about our own biases and, and blind spots, because I found a lot of people find it sometimes hard to acknowledge their own bias. They may see bias in other things, but, you know, getting it a little too close to home is always very interesting. So I wonder how hard you go at the relationship between bias and ethics, because I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure you must, they must intrude on each other. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that um, all of this work is a bit of a delicate dance in the sense of that you have to kind of come into a space. And what I try and do is come in with an enabling mindset. That doesn't mean I'm not going to call out tough issues and, have, and put them on the table. Um, but it also doesn't mean that I come in as, as the interrogator. And I think that's where... Um, it's easy when we live in a bubble like I live in, for example, in the AI ethics community, um, because we see a lot of things that are really quite awful, I have to say, um, just horrendous uses of the technology, um, ill intentions, all of this kind of stuff. And so we are sort of steeped in that. And it's hard sometimes to, you know, put that down and come into a space from a fresh perspective and just meet people where they're at. But that's really what I try and do in the work that I do. And it's not necessarily going straight in and um, and talking about biases that may or may not be the, the place to start. Um, but eventually you will kind of get to that piece of the conversation, if that makes sense. So I think every I always kind of treat every opportunity as a bespoke sort of project and, and looking at it from the perspective of what does this person or this organization need to get out of this in order to move forward in the responsible AI journey. And that's sort of my approach to the whole thing. I wonder too how much um, discussion you have ahead of time with uh, whoever the powers that are, be that maybe someone who's booked you or perhaps it's uh, somebody that's officially asked you to come in. Um, do you do you have to do a bit of a? Um, I imagine you do an assessment to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you always want to have that kind of informal discussion assessment um, to see what is going on surface kind of what the core issues might be that need to be addressed in terms of the more formal engagement piece of things. And again, that can be um, informal conversations or using some of the tools um, like an AI blind spots process, for example, to kind of raise those questions and raise those issues. I have to give you a story of myself. I was working in the open data uh, group, the city of Toronto, ended up as their lead actually. Fast forward some years after I left the city and we're having some discussions about bias and uh, I, I, I really hate admitting this, but I, I had trouble acknowledging that my work in the city of Toronto did reflect some bias in the data in the city of Toronto. And I'm not sure why I had that particular blind spot. I guess I felt that the uh, divisions and so on gathering their data and the questions they might be asking, they were the pros and they would be doing um, a perfect job. So I've, re I've come to realize since that that just isn't possible. And, and I wonder if you found difficulties in just that, this quest for perfection or even acknowledgement that some of the things that might be used in analysis in a company or even hiring in a company. I mean, what's your experience there with people that are, are maybe blissfully unaware, perhaps, that their ethics are being reflected in a way that uh, some people wouldn't acknowledge? Mm. 
Um, your whole comment about hiring data um, may, reminded me of a book that I read recently by Hilke Shulman, who's a, a journalist. And um, in her book about hiring, she she says all hiring data is biased. And, and I was just thinking about that as you were making that comment. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, we live in an imperfect world and all of this data is coming from our imperfect world. And so, of course, it sort of makes sense that it will be biased. And I, I think the thing about bias too is that I don't know that you fully like what is you know the perfect unbiased data sample what does that really look like some of that might be contextual like maybe if you're doing a research study and you're trying to get the perfect levels of you know representation in your data the problem is we're using administrative data we're not it's not like we're going out there and purposefully collecting data for something and you know making sure we have the exact right mix that's really not the kind of data that we're we're using in a lot of cases it's data that is the exhaust of something else of some other process that gets pumped back into an algorithmic system and then used so of course it's going to be imperfect it wasn't even collected for the purposes that you're using it for. Yeah, those are good points for sure. And uh, one of the things that I, I believe you say is your strengths is the idea of ensuring a diverse set of people are involved. And you've, you've touched on that already. Um, and, and even that sometimes is a, is a tough quest. I mean, I've certainly found that what's missing, I think, from a lot of the AI stuff, the business of AI, is just that. Uh, bringing in people who are non developers, non-technicians, non-science into the discussion. And I'm not really talking focus groups, but I'm talking to, you know, have them almost intern for a while inside the company, or at the very least, involve them on, on a different level than they have been. So bring in the hairdressers, bring in the cashiers, and so on. I wonder how far you've gone with, with this diversity, or, you know, where, how does that play out for you? Thank you. Quite honestly, I think there's a lot of talk about it, but I don't think very many companies are actually doing it. Mm -hmm. I hate to say. Um, so I think it's, um, so companies will do things like focus groups or stakeholder groups or user groups or things that involve their customers. And there's lots of processes and lots of guidance in how to do that. And there's people whose actual job it is to do that. Um, how far that kind of intersects with the broader perspectives of who might be impacted by your product, who isn't your customer, that's, I think, where it gets a, a little bit trickier because now it's about spending money to ensure that that person who may never be your customer, it, how are they going to be impacted by what you're doing and to what degree or extent you're going to actually do something about that if you learn that there might be an impact. And so that's a trickier conversation because it doesn't fit with the typical market research kind of stakeholder engagement approach. Um, I do think governments understand that a bit more because governments get that they have to be incredibly inclusive to the, the entire citizenry. And that really can have impacts in terms of, you know, getting voted back in, let's say. And so I think they understand that broader stakeholder engagement piece a little bit more than actual companies. So it's it's kind of tricky. And then you layer on the fact that to engage stakeholders well, you almost need to do a level of education before you come in and ask them all these questions about your product and AI and how it might impact them. They need to have a level setting about what is this all about? And I, that's not just true of AI, it's true of all kinds of technical engagements that you might want to do. And so that's what makes it, I think, tricky to do and, and really challenging. And that's why I think many organizations haven't necessarily done a great job of it yet. Yeah, I think it's a it's a real commitment that I agree with you. We, we really are yet to have yet to see by a lot of uh, companies who are interested in um, the bottom lines and those kind of things. The investment in it, it reminds me back in uh, when accessibility was coming about. Uh, for things like hearing impaired and so on. So, so you know, people starting to add captions or even have people signing and so on. You see, you see way more evidence of that today than you used to. And there was a commitment to that, right? Because at the times uh, changed, you needed someone to maybe do the captionings and typing those things in, although technology is really assisting with a lot of those things. Um, I, I had a chat with someone that I, I wanted to talk to you about in terms of this, this issue of understanding the biases and getting it all together. And her suggestion was we actually throw all the bias that we know into an AI and let the AI thrash it about and kind of come to some conclusions on what the perfect unbiased thing would be. 
And I thought that, that to me was quite a cool idea because as you say, how do we know, you know, we may not even really reflect that this is a biased thing that we're putting together. We think we're doing our due diligence, but somebody somewhere surely is gonna discover something about it. And the inclusivity is a hard challenge, right? To, to really get it right. And from listening to what you just said too, the unforeseen consequences, a company may not consider uh, a certain consumer to be a part of what they're doing, but there may be some impacts to that consumer further down the line, be it use of the product that this company is making being used in another product. I'm thinking of cars and how AI is moving into, into cars, everything from the entertainment systems to self-driving and so on. I wonder if you want to comment on any of that. Well, my cynical self says, haven't we kind of already done that with chat GPT? We've sort of thrown all the biased, you know, internet data into something and we're remixing it in horrible ways and coming up with new, you know, amplified stereotypes and so forth. Um, I think the question of bias is important, but um, it's not certainly not the only issue. I think one of the concerns I have is it tends to suck all the oxygen out of the room and everybody gets really focused on how can we just debias our data and then all will be well in the world of AI. And it's not that I don't think that's important to, to think about. Certainly it is. Um, I don't know to what degree it's really possible. And I want to just kind of stick on this idea of, of what are we actually trying to do with machine learning? If we think about what we're trying to do with it, we're trying to classify objects or people, we're trying to put things into groups, and then we're trying to make some predictions um, based on the classification. And sometimes that's based on inferences. It's not really actually known data. It's sort of implied data based on, you know, the fact that you have a bunch of guitars hanging in the background. Maybe I infer that you like music or you are a musician or something of that nature. So models are doing those kinds of things too. And then they're making predictions about you because if you like this, you, you know, you might be like these kinds of people. So I think it's this other piece that we also need to attend to, um, not just necessarily thinking about, you know, trying to get some perfect data set, but the bigger questions around this can be a useful way of thinking about the world, but when it becomes the only way that we know things about the world, this whole idea of probability and statistics becomes the dominant way that we learn things about the world and we forget about lived experience and other things, to what degree does that then impact our ability as a society to think about things you know, in different ways, in different contexts. And that to me impacts diversity as well. So I think about these things in the more expansive way, uh, you know, in terms of the issue of bias, let's say, or diversity. And it's not only the data, but it's this whole set of logics that back it up. Uh, I think this is a good se segue to, to move off of bias, but I'm, I'm planning a series, by the way, called It's All B-A-I-S, um, which I think is catchy, but I, it gives me pause to think about that, especially if we're dealing with ethics, you know, the large thing. Uh, what, what, what are we really talking about in terms of things that we need to discuss? So bias is one of them, but what else comes into play in the, in the ethics training that you're doing? Yeah, well, privacy is definitely another big one for sure. Um, so when we think about the need for all of this data to feed these models, that really um, kind of can lead to an over surveillance culture. And I'm doing some work right now with a group that's looking at workplaces. And it's absolutely shocking to me how many things that workplaces are tracking or that they can track. So they're able to track granular levels of data to know things about people. They're able to share that, not just within the company, but between companies as well. And I think all of this has some real, um, it's some questions about where we're going with employment. Because if you think about this, if data is shared about you, let's say it's not even totally accurate data, it, it's inferences or presumptions about you that become you know, verified, let's say by these AI systems. And let's say that's kind of negative. This could impact your ability to get a job if that data is shared widely with a whole bunch of other companies. So this is the kind of thing that's happening. Um, the panopticon is something that is talked about in, um, in philosophy, and it's this idea for, um, it was an idea for a prison, 
And it's this idea that you can be watched at any moment, but you don't really know if you're being watched 100%, but just the idea that you might be being watched, it really has an impact on you psychologically and behaviorally. And I think we're creating these panoptic workplaces with these kinds of technologies, and that's really disturbing. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think we've seen a lot more evidence of this moving into the workplace and um, even with COVID working from home, I was a little shocked. Although I understand it from one perspective, you know, the, the employer wants to make sure they're doing work, but you know, the drilling down and you're gonna be able to tell keyboard strokes and how long you're actually on the keyboard and those kind of things. And, but outside of AI realm, I mean, you've got even Amazon, which their employees don't get breaks really. I was just watching something today that talked about they, they don't have washroom breaks. And I'd heard that before, but this was kind of a documentary. And if that's still true, you know, that's, that's excessive ownership of the person. And, uh, and certainly as we get into the privacy realm now and, and this assumption of being watched, I like that as a, as a, a motif for people to think about it, because you're quite right. I think we behave differently if we think we're being watched. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you saw the story, it was last week and there was a robot that was sent out to a bunch of government buildings. I think it might've been in Gatineau and the robot was scouting around, presumably to just measure the space and see how it was being utilized and check the air quality. But there was a whole story about this because of course the employees see this robot and they think, oh, we're being surveilled. And so there was this whole tension between the workers groups and the unions and management kind of sorting it out in this article. And that's the kind of thing that I think we're, you know, we're seeing more and more of that. That's an embodied robot. Not, not all of these technologies are embodied. Some of them are, are just digital uh, type technologies, but we're also getting to a place where we're going to see more digital workers, AI agents, digital assistants, all of these kinds of digital tools with varying degrees of agency being in our workplace. So that's kind of one set of issues. Um, and I'll segue that from just privacy to what does this mean for relationships? What does it mean to have a relationship with a digital coworker, an AI coworker? How should we relate to these tools? And there's a whole um, range of things. There's things like transparency and disclosure, knowing that you're talking with an AI, for example, knowing that it's a chatbot or knowing this content came from an AI system and not a human, all the way to people who maybe become overattached to these particular tools for all kinds of reasons. So there's a whole lot of other issues there when it comes to relating to these systems. Yeah, I think there's so much in your content there in terms of um, the privacy too. Uh, I mean, there's things that have happened in the past that would have been considered an invasion of privacy. Um, and, and a lot of it was just different because the technology wasn't there. Um, so in terms of what, let's say, police might be doing or even a, a large corporation, the technique has changed and it has become more invasive. But I don't think that the conversation itself has changed except we've ratcheted everything up now. And I think it's in one, if you look at the bright side, it's probably helped people recognize, oh my goodness, this is too invasive and people are starting to draw lines. And you mentioned that unions actually, and I'm wondering how much uh, you're finding of, of discussions between unions and management around these, these um, uh, issues themselves and all the different layers as well. Is it coming up or are you encountering requests? I done any work with unions specifically, though I'd love to if there are any out there that want to, to do this kind of work. I think it personally, I think it should be part of collective bargaining. And I think it should be part of what is discussed in terms of what is acceptable or not acceptable. Um, but, I, you know, the story caught my eye because obviously the union rep was like, hey, this is this is feeling invasive now. And I think part of it was it was a robot. It was embodied. So it was something that you could point at and say this feels invasive versus digital systems that don't have an embodied um, facet to them. It's harder, I think, to really kind of point at it. Um, the other thing, I just want to kind of point out this whole thing of our comforts with all of this, because the flip side of this is we've invited a lot of surveillance into our life in general. So if you think about all of these things like the Google Home device, Alexa's, even Siri on our phone, all of these things are kind of invited into our life. And they had kind of this weird notion of 
the vampire. And you know the vampire stories? When if you invite the vampire in, then the vampire gets a lot more latitude because they've been invited into the space now. Now they're not breaking in, they're in your space by invitation. And I was sort of thinking about that in the context of these technologies and where we're at culturally with these things, because we've had these technologies for a while now. They didn't arrive a year and a half ago, just like Chat TPT. They've actually been in our world for longer than that. Yeah, it's so true. And uh, I just think it's back to agency too. It's where, um, even if it's not unions, you can huddle as an employee with your other employees and talk about it and bring it up at meetings, right? It doesn't have to be a negotiation per se, uh, but it should be a discussion um, and, and where things are moving. And there's so many different industries and businesses. Not all of them are gonna hire uh, assembly line robotics and that kind of thing. And, and as it cascades upward to beyond, let's say that kind of AI, um, you know, the very, the job is all the same. That's easy to see how AI can be used, but it gets into more complexity, like replacing copywriters and things like that. That's where I think, um, it's funny because it's more inclusionary now in our discussions, right? It's starting to wrap its head around a lot more people. Um, I wanna move back to some of the other uh, layers though in your discussion. So we've got the privacy, we've got the, um, uh, the ethics. Uh, what else is in this roster of your discussions? Mm -hmm. um, so we've already talked about fairness and bias. That, that definitely is a popular one. Um, the other one that comes up a lot is this idea of explainability or lack of explainability for some of these systems. How exactly do they work? And in many cases, for the more complicated ones, the people who build them don't actually know exactly how they work. And this starts to impact our idea of autonomy and agency and being able to make good decisions when we're not really sure how something works and someone can't really explain it to us. So there's a whole set of questions around that. And in what context is, is clear explainability incredibly important and we need to make sure that we have that even if we're not going to get as sophisticated a system from a, a technological standpoint or in what context perhaps is that less important and it's more important to have the technical, let's say, accuracy of a system. So that tends to be another one that comes up a lot. Um, and then the idea of, I think, like relationships, and I've sort of touched on that a little bit too. Um, it can be something as simple as over-relying on a machine. So automation bias, always trusting the machine, believing the machine is better, it's more objective, it's more accurate than you are. Um, all the way to companies who've developed AI systems for the purposes of you to have a relationship with it, i.e. AI girlfriends and boyfriends and that sort of thing, AI friends. And what does that mean, especially for young people in terms of social development? I mean, we're having all these conversations about social media and how that's been bad. Um, what does it mean when all your friends are AI friends? So those are some of the other kinds of um, questions that will come up in some of the, the work that I do. And is your end goal to, I suspect I know the answer, but the idea that it's complete now, you can leave that company and they're good, or is it more to get them down the road and they're on the right track and they're starting to be aware and conscious now of all these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's not a one and done, that's for sure. Um, so I think a lot of, because it's early days in particular, sometimes the engagement at this stage is simply an awareness. Here are the things you need to think about. Sometimes it's let's get some of this program set up, like let's get some basic policies in place, that kind of thing, or something more than that. Let's do an assessment of a particular project that you're doing. But in any kind of engagement, I always mention this idea that there's this ongoing commitment piece that needs to happen, whether you're building an AI system and responsible for it out in the world, or you've deployed it in your organization. It's not a set it and forget it kind of technology. And so you do need to have mechanisms in place to monitor things. You do, do need to have mechanisms in place to review things on a regular basis. And especially as regulation is changing and you don't want to be offside in compliance, you need to know what the new laws are and when they're coming in and how do we make sure we're on side. So there's a whole lot of pieces that are changing, shifting and evolving. So companies need to be aware of all of that and they need to make this ongoing commitment to that process. Do you find that um, companies are are behind that or expect that? Or are they more like, well, listen, I've got 400 employees, two different locations. I want you to come in and do a session on ethics and then we'll be good. 
I mean, how, how much do you have to kind of uh, rattle the chains a little bit to get people to think fully and not one and done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still early days, so I'm hopeful that it's not, uh, you know, just come in and do this one session and then we're good. Um, but a lot of it at this stage is still education and awareness and, and maybe some training and, and those kinds of things. And, and some for some of the more forward thinking organizations, some of those other pieces that I mentioned, but it's certainly something that I, I do think about in terms of, um, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, we had our one ethics training session and now we should all be great and fine and good to go. Um, I'm hoping that that's not the message that I, I leave people with because it's certainly not what I think needs to happen. Yeah, I'm wondering too, the, um, some companies are very good at, at presenting their ethics, their literature or perhaps their products talk about these very issues. Um, and I guess what I'm interested in too is the, the values therefore attached and also the, the language that's used. I mean, I, I was thinking about this this morning Google used to have, as I understand, it's no longer there, but it was the idea of do no harm. And that's very simple, uh, but easily recognized and analyzed, but you could always do a deep dive. Well, what does harm mean? You know, because sometimes harm may have a value. We could argue about that. Uh, yeah, what's your take on the too bureaucratic? Let's say, I know you've done work with governments. Are they getting too into the weeds and making things too complex? Or on the other hand, are they, in the right spirit, they're, they're laying down some perfectly understandable values and ethics. Yeah, so Google, I think it was don't be evil. Is that the one you're thinking oh, of? Yeah, Google, maybe it is don't, don't be evil. evil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The there on the, I'm mixing it up. Yeah. yeah, so so here was my pet peeve coming out of my research that I did when I was a student a couple of years ago doing my master's in communications and technology. And it was very much, everybody had this sort of 50,000 foot ethical code, let's be responsible, let's uphold this and that. Yes, 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 all good to agree to, nothing that can you could not agree with. But very few organizations had anything beyond that in terms of, okay, so how are we actually going to do this? And that became kind of the focus of, of what I got obsessed with um, when I launched my company. How exactly are we going to know? And there's different layers to this. So a lot of what I talk about doing or trying to put in place is how do you go from your principle, you know, let's be responsible, to your actual policy and spell out, okay, what does that mean in the context of our company or organization, that sort of thing? to actually pushing that down into a procedure and a practice at the frontline level. And that's going to vary depending on who you are in that organization, what that exactly looks like. But that is the work. That is the work that needs to be done. It's a tough uh, piece of work. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of effort to keep it going. And, and you're not going to get it right the first time necessarily. But that's the work of actually implementing responsible AI is moving it from your highest level principle down into your organization. So that it becomes part of people's job, essentially. Yeah, and I mean, that's perfectly understandable. You would hope that it would be something that everybody thinks of consistently and constantly. I mean, not perhaps every single day at every single meeting, but as change is discussed and evolution of a company and takeover of another company who may have specific values that they've put down. Uh, I'm thinking there of when Facebook bought uh, WhatsApp, I believe it was. Uh, very, very, very different uh, principles in terms of how things would, would relate with privacy and so on. And I think from a consumer again, they, they may not always be cognizant of the fact that, yeah, the company's actually changed. It's been bought over. And so what used to be may not be the, the same. Um, and and I, I think when, in hearing the kind of things we're talking about right now, too, I think the consistency is important, but also the overt uh, transparency of this is really important, right? If, if they're working on them or they've already worked on them, they should be available and findable, correct? Yeah, transparency is another one of those kind of core principles, and that can play out in different ways. Um, everyone has a terms and conditions uh, statement. Some of them are very long and hard to understand. That's a form of transparency. It's not always the easiest form to engage with. Um, one of the things that I think governments need to do is to get a lot better at 
telling the citizens, um, whether that's, you know, in a, a city or a province or, you know, in a country, where is AI being used? And so there's this idea of like AI registries and, and those sorts of things where you can publicly disclose your use of AI. And there are some cities um, in, I'm familiar with some in the US that have started to do that. I'm not as sure about Canada if that's been the case or not, but that's something that, you know, is a form of transparency as well. Um, or even if you're just, if you have a chat bot, just making sure that your customers know this is actually an AI chat bot. There's not a human chatting on the other end of it. So that's another kind of way to think about transparency and disclosure. I'm finding too, the uh, European Union has been very active in terms of identification of things. And um, it was a couple of years ago, I think websites had to evolve quite a bit in terms of um, what cookie use and identifying and so on. And, and I found there's the spirit of the thing and then there's the, the legal thing. So technically some companies would, are providing this choice, but if you actually go in and you don't want anything on, you have to go in and click off, 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 off. Um, I, I, was, I do this routinely on some when it appears just to see how many exist, thousands in some cases. And I, I don't feel that's very good ethics. And mm -hmm. so this may be simplistic ethics, but the law is saying you have to give a uh, user the ability to turn off a lot of this tracking. And so they've gone, okay. And, and technically they are providing that, but what does it say, right? Why make it so difficult? And then the, the, the glorious ones are that, that you have reject all, right? So there's, there's really that extreme of a continuum. And I, I'd like you to just talk a bit about that in relation to the difficulty, I think, of, of, a, of assigning someone's values. I mean, maybe a corporate exec or a company that feels that fits their values, you know? Most people are gonna give up and that's good because they're still gonna get the data. That may be their value. Uh, and then there's others who say, well, no, let's, let's really go all in on this and make a reject all button. Yeah, I just want to touch on this idea of the limits of transparency. And I'll share, I'm only halfway through this book, but I'll, I'll mention it because it's talking about this issue. So this is a book called um, Technologies of Speculation by Sun Ha Hong. And um, he's a professor at Simon Fraser University. And again, I'm only halfway through the book, but what I've read so far is really talking about this idea that transparency is not the panacea perhaps that we think it is. So in my world, we do talk about the importance of transparency and I've just given you some thoughts on that earlier. But um, the way Hong kind of positions this is, is sort of where you're going in that, well, we have all this stuff, it's technically transparent, but we don't really know what it means or it takes too long to understand it or it's done in such a way that it's kind of obfuscates the, the idea of, of actually being transparent. And he has other examples about this where we're just overwhelmed with too much and how do we actually, how does transparency actually then get to the better um, kind of goal, the more ethical kind of uh, goal of really giving you the ability to, you know, be informed in some way. And so that's sort of a new work that I'm just in the middle of. And it reminded me, your question reminded me of that. Um, so in terms of going back to the other part of your question, tone at the top is incredibly important for an organization. So leaders really set the tone for what's possible or not possible within their organization. And if you don't have kind of that great tone at the top, um, it doesn't necessarily permeate down. And people can tell when you're faking it. They can tell when you're saying the nice platitudes and the nice words, but really what you care about is getting the data or making money or whatever that is, um, and not these other things. So you privilege those things over these things. People understand that. And then they kind of take their marching orders accordingly. So I think that, that then this goes back to just business ethics, right? What are your values? How are you going to then live out those values in the context of what you actually do? What does that look like? Um, and it's tough because this intersects with the law that just says, oh, yeah, you got to put all these cookie notices up there now because guess what? We've got GDPR in place and it says you got to do these things. Then how you actually do that, you know, I think can be reflective of, of who you are as a company. How do you make that maybe easier or harder to uh, to comply with? Yeah, and I, and I think this goes back to agency too. The consumer can um, do something about it in many ways, either don't go to the website or comment on, on the website itself or whatever it might be. Um, I've, I've noticed a lot of the apps that are being developed these days, um, at least the iPhone is, is saying where the data is used. And in some cases, it seems pretty extreme and would have no real sense or logic for the app. 
um, you know, things like identifiers, contacts, all of these kinds of things. And I can recall one of the best lessons I got from city clerk's office, again, when I was working in the city of Toronto, uh, was on surveys and so on. If you don't need it, don't ask for it. Now, that was a nice value, I thought. And it, I think it, it, it was stand-up ethics in that sense. Um, because why are you pulling in data that you don't need? Yet it seems to happen a lot. Well, I think you have to kind of flip this around and think about it from the perspective of someone building a modern machine learning AI system. All data is useful data, all data. And so this idea of like data that I need or data minimization or just going to take what I need, well, we don't really know what we need. So we want everything. We want all of your data, not only the data we could gather, we want the data that all those other companies gather too, because we might get something out of it. And so it really kind of flips on its head, the old notion, again, that data is, is there to facilitate a particular, I don't know, transaction or something of that nature. That's not really what's happening. The, the political economy of data is such that the more we have, the better it is for us. And let's just get as much as we can. And that's really kind of the spirit behind a lot of these kind of technologies, especially things like large language models that really, you know, the name kind of says it all. Um, and that's the challenge, I think. It's a challenge for fair information principles about data minimization, necessity, proportionality, all these things that we talk about. But now we're in this other world where just give us as much data as we can get. Yeah, I think it raises the issue too for some people, and certainly many that I've encountered would say, oh, it doesn't matter. You can have everything. I don't care. I don't care. And, you know, they may be right in one sense that in their lifetime or their life experience that it's not really going to impact them it may not impact them in a job or getting a loan or whatever um yet you do hear stories about people's let's say facebook postings from when they were in college or university coming back to haunt them those are simple examples i think but there could be a little more um deep dive examples too that may come up um especially if times get really dark and i'm thinking of the u.s uh in terms of potential invasiveness there um so you're, you're right, uh, it's get as much data as possible. And I think it's, it's sometimes reflected on society as not protesting about that, or at least asking why. I think it's a fundamental question to ask, why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that is definitely, I see that with some of what I'm, I'm seeing in the workplace surveillance in terms of monitoring everything that you're doing so that we can know if you're you know, a good employee, again, going back to that classification and prediction, or whether we should let you go at the first opportunity. These are the kinds of things that are kind of coming up in the context of that. But the other thing I'll say is that it's not just about you. Your data is not just about you. It reveals things that can impact other people. And that's the harder thing, because let's say I decide that we can know everything about Katrina Ingram. She's an open book, going to like live my life online and everything about me is out there. So that just doesn't have implications for me. It has implications for anybody that the system infers is like me. And so if there is an inference made about another person who didn't really want to be part of that project, but they kind of look like they're similar to me, and maybe there's some negative consequence attached to that, they are implicated in that project, even as I, as the individual, chose to share all my data. So it's more complicated, I think, than just saying it's just about me or you and our data and what we want and how it's going to impact us or certainly that, but there's all of these other pieces to it as well. I like the word complexity for so many reasons, but do you think it's become too complex to um, resolve? And, and I'm, I want to introduce the, the idea, too, of different uh, locations. For, for instance, the um, Quebec is very different to Ontario. And often you'll see uh, prizes and things like that offered in contests in Quebec. There's, there's this sidebar for, for Quebec. So that's a quick example I'm thinking of. But um, because the world is so immediate, in, in the sense that you can find out what's happening instantly all over the world, and we never used to be able to do that. Is it, is it just the, almost the impossible dream to resolve many of the complexities? And I'm also thinking of offices that have different countries. So they have got an office in the States, they've got one in Canada, one in uh, Germany, et cetera. I mean, how does that somehow get worked out? <laughs> yeah. I talked to an organization like that not that long ago, big global organization, offices everywhere. One way you could work it out is you could take the highest standard 
in, in a lot of cases, that's Europe. So I'll just use that as an example. And then you apply that standard everywhere and you're covered because everybody else will have a lower standard. But there is a cost to doing that, right? So you have to kind of think about that. But that is one way that you could figure it out. Um, I think most of those organizations and companies are, are doing it a little bit more, you know, country by country. Um, certainly, though, I think there needs to be some level of interoperability. And that's why I think a lot of governments are paying attention to each other. So now that the EU has put a stake in the ground with respect to AI regulation, others are looking to see what do we think about that? Do we think that we could adhere to that or not? And so these are the conversations that are happening right now. Um, but yeah, it's challenging to kind of get that level of agreement sometimes, but for big global organizations, that's a space that they definitely have to navigate. Do you find to uh, bringing it back to Canada uh, directly, um, municipal government, provincial government, and federal government, um, there's a lot of issues at play there too, in terms of, you know, budgets and, and you know, the province asks the feds for money and the cities are asked and so on. Uh, is that a little easier, though, in a way to manage? Because the, the incentive is different than the capital and the making money. It's services as opposed to. It's still challenging um, to manage. It has, it, you know, it's replete with all the usual politics of intergovernmental um, discussions and negotiations. And so a lot of it, I think, you know, from an AI perspective, when you think about well, who has jurisdiction over something that might be related, for example, privacy law. So um, there are provinces like here in Alberta, we have our own privacy laws. And so there's, you know, jurisdictional um, kind of pieces to that, except for, you know, the kinds of companies that would have maybe a federal jurisdiction. So you kind of have to know what level of regulation you're dealing with and, and where you fit. That's sort of like the first piece of privacy is sort of figure out which jurisdiction and which laws actually apply to you. Um, and go from there. And I think similarly with the AI regulation, we don't have one yet. Um, we're, we're looking at maybe getting one with the LC27 and um, AIDA. And then how will that play out um, in terms of, you know, provinces or even different kinds of domains where there might be more sensitivities? Um, I don't know, I'm thinking like healthcare and those kinds of things. So we, we have yet to see how that's all going to unfold. And I think to the idea of legislation, does come up. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of, of it to a degree. I don't like regulation overall, but I, I think, you know, we need to think about some, what, what I feel happened with the um, tech industry and AI's sort of offshoot of that was this idea of let's break it up and let's do what we can to really, you know, change things. And, and I, I like that initially back in the day, but now I think that we've actually seen, I like to say our first experience with AI has been social media. And the developers of that had no idea that the algorithms could be so successful in terms of generating money and pushing out information and attracting all kinds of things from, from followers and, and likes and all of that, right? Um, so I think there's, there's an area for that. I'm wondering if it's a little harder, though. It's one thing to say to a company, you've got to alter your algorithm. So cease and desist these layers or something. Um, it's a little harder to legislate values, right? So would this be almost the don't go there, like in terms of legislation? I guess we have legislation for hate speech and so on, and free speech is conflicting in some cases with that, back to the social media places. Um, but wouldn't that be the hardest spot to legislate? I don't think so, because I think all policies have values baked into them. Whether we want to acknowledge them as values or not, they are definitely baked in. So for example, even just privileging the idea of the economy, right? we got to put the economy first. We don't want to stifle innovation, all of that. There's a value judgment around that, right? The value judgment is we privilege the economy over, I don't know, human rights or something like that. We, we might not want to state it that way, but it's sort of baked into how things get rolled out. And so I think if you were to, you know, if we were to sit here and unpack a bunch of policy, we would probably get to the value that's being privileged underneath all of those various policies. And so I think this is done all the time. We just might not call it out. Yeah, interesting, I think. Um, as, uh, let's say uh, we'll, we'll begin to wrap up at this point. Uh, I, I'd like to know wh where you think we're headed. And I don't know if it's fair to even ask of a timeline, but are you optimistic and do you feel that much of this will be 
covered off or dealt with in reasonable ways over how many years? Is that even possible to find? Yeah, I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think the big thing that I think needs to shift, kind of going back to values and agendas and that sort of thing, is we need to find a way for the public space to have more power in this conversation. Because what shocks me, quite frankly, and this isn't just an AI thing, um, it's a technology thing in general, is how much of our world is mediated by a handful of technology companies. We could sit here and name them and we probably wouldn't get past our, our 10 fingers in doing so. And that I think is concerning. It's concerning because we don't necessarily have, um, when I think about public values, I, I say this to someone who had a career in public broadcasting before coming into the work that I do right now, but public broadcasting was a special space because we did things in public broadcasting because they had public benefit, because we were on a mission, because we believed that these things were necessary, not necessarily because we were chasing a dollar. Sure, we needed to stay in business and, and be viable and, and all of that good stuff, but we had kind of different values backing the choices that we made. And I don't see that happening in this digital space. And I really think that we need to have that um, ability to get back there. But the challenge is all this infrastructure, these cloud computing infrastructures and so forth, they're not publicly owned. They're privately owned by this handful of companies. And so this to me is one of the big challenges is thinking through the infrastructure pieces that really should have a public component to them, but at this point don't necessarily have that. I couldn't agree more too in terms of um... The monopoly really that exists in, in, in other areas it was never allowed to exist but in tech for some reason it's okay, <laughs> okay. so that that may be something for again citizen agency government agency to think about is you know maybe we should really look at breaking things up i i find it difficult in canada in a sense because we're so small relative to our neighbor in particular and so we could make a decision and this has come up with uh, the arguments for the the companies that we're talking about to um, pay for the news and so on and how um, I think Australia went through the same thing right they well okay we'll just pull news from your feed and so on so uh, yeah we may be at somewhat of a disadvantage but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it and I want to ask how you feel about Canada as a bit of a a role player in some of these discussions because you know so many people say oh Canadians are so nice you know, would we be good facilitators in these discussions, uh, do you think? Well, I like to think so. I really do think we're nice and I do think we're diplomatic. And I think we are in the middle between kind of the European um, perspective and the American perspective. We're kind of a balance in the middle. So I think we have an interesting role to play. And yeah, we are a smaller country. So in some ways we've had to kind of navigate um, the politics, let's say, of having to deal with larger companies or, or sorry, larger countries. And so I think maybe we're well suited to that kind of a role. Yeah, I'll put you down as a yes. <laughs> okay. It's been, it's been rapid fire on our first episode. I appreciate you being with us and your information. You've given me a lot to uh, think about and apply uh in my own work and uh you know i would say uh, keep at it and uh, let's continue the dialogue that we're having certainly and i just want to uh, mention your websites uh, again for uh, people to take note of and uh, you do have a contact information on your website there so um, people can if they want to uh, reach out to you they can do that or through link linkedin and um so again i just want to thank you for uh for uh, being here and uh uh Zooming in all the way from Edmonton. Well, thanks so much, Keith. It's been a real treat. Thank you. Awesome. And now just some uh, publicity for myself here. This is where you can reach me. If I get a like, if you like what you're hearing, like us, follow, subscribe. Here's some places you can find me. LinkedIn.com backslash company. Literacy AI is the company page. Backslash in backslash phone. Uh, is the LinkedIn page and Literacy AI TV is the YouTube channel. If that went uh, too fast, uh, you can go to the website literacy, literacyai.com and find out all you need there. Thanks for watching, folks.